Thanks uh, for the terrific uh, opportunity to be here and to discuss uh, these interesting presentations from four very distinguished uh, presenters, all of whom have, have a fascinating biography. You should look in the, in the bio book, all of whom are, 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 have a long distinguished career in and around the official sector, and they're very astute observers of where official thinking is. I'm not saying they were responsible for what happened, or you should hold them responsible for what happens next. But I, I think I, there is much to be encouraged about from, from what they said. However, given the lateness of the hour, I, I, w I would uh, instead propose to focus on, I think, um, we could call it simplifying, or perhaps I'll just uh, say, call it the less polite version of what you gentlemen have said. And in fact, on that, I'll be less polite than you as well. I think it's time to take the gloves off. I think the problems that we face in and around these mega banks, in, in I think all the economies present here this evening, these problems are severe, they are pressing. The hour is much later than you might like to think. Just to frame this for you, who in the room thinks that if Goldman Sachs would hit a rock, a hypothetical rock, I'm not saying they have, I'm not saying they will, if they hit a rock today, Saturday, who here thinks they were allowed to fail, like Lehman Brothers did, unimpeded by any kind of government bailout starting Monday morning? Can Goldman Sachs fail? <laughs> I've asked this question around the country, only one person has ever raised his hand. It was in New York, he had a big short position in Goldman stock. That's, that's New York. <laughs> But seriously, it, it can't happen. Goldman Sachs is a $900 billion bank, total balance sheet. Uh, you might want to say it's too big to fail. You might want to use the language of Mervyn King, too important to fail. You wouldn't allow it to fail. I wouldn't allow it to fail if it was my decision. You wouldn't either. It's too scary today, given the nature of the global economy. And from that scariness comes power comes an enormous amount of power. Now, what happened to our ideas to reform this and to deal with this? And let, let me go through each of these the point, important points made here in, in, in turn. One idea was to have a resolution authority. Gary flagged this for you. But again, Gary, I'm going to push to a more forceful version. Larry Summers mentioned this last night. But he, and he said, we created a resolution authority under Dodd-Frank, which is true. But he neglected to mention, I think perhaps he just ran out of time, that there's a loophole, a big loophole. The Dodd-Frank Resolution Authority doesn't apply to Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan Chase or Citigroup or any other global bank. It's not a cross-border resolution authority. It wouldn't help you, for example, in the instance of Lehman Brothers failing again. That was an intensely cross-border issue, as Gary pointed out to you. We have nothing in terms of resolution authority. We have two choices if Goldman or Citi. Citi does business. They say in 171 countries, Goldman brags about doing business in 90 dialects. If one of these banks were to be on the brink of failure, you have two choices. Let them collapse in a form of bankruptcy, as was the case with Lehman, or provide them with some form of unsavory bailout, particularly complete protection for their creditors. Those are your choices. The resolution authority approach has, has failed completely. Gary, you can come back to me. Eric laid out these beautiful maps that show you the complexity, the size, the range of activities of some of our global banks, just focusing on those European banks within his purview. And of course, if you lay out um, the banks in the United States, it's even more dramatic, that, that, that kind of map. And there was an idea in 2009 to make these banks simpler, make them smaller, reduce the scale of their activities. Various versions of this were put, were put forward. Um, Vikram Pandit, uh, CEO of Citigroup, actually had to downsize uh, Citigroup to some degree, partly because he got so much pressure from the government, his major shareholder. Where, where do we stand on this reduction in size or scope or simplifying these large financial institutions today? It's, it's going the other way. Too big to fail firms, banks have gotten bigger. That's the conclusion of a Bloomberg report I'd be happy to, to share with all of you. The big European, uh, Jacques Delarossier, the former managing director of the IMF, no less, wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times recently saying, universal banks in Europe are great. They're a source of stability, which, which I, I'm sorry, with all due respect to Mr. De La Rossier, who apparently has been working very closely with the financial sector in, in a recent decade. That's not true. That's not what happened. That's not the history. Again, Eric, you can come back and tell me I'm wrong. Tell me that I've misunderstood recent European history. But that's the reality. The bigger banks are getting bigger. Of course they're getting bigger. They're too big to fail. They can borrow more cheaply than their smaller competitors who can fail. What do they want to do? What's their, what's their global vision? 
What does Mr. Panda want to do? What does Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, want to do? They want to become more global. They want to be highly leveraged. They want to be bigger. They want to go into emerging markets and take more risk. You can come back to me on that, Andrew, whether that's a good idea, thinking about the implications. Mr. Pandit told the National Journal recently his goal is to build a Citigroup in the image of Walter Riston, a former CEO of Citigroup, who in the 1970s took in deposits from around the world, lent them on to Latin America and communist Poland and communist Romania, and blew up Citibank in 1982 on the basis of those emerging market loans. Citigroup, by the way, there's been some reference, a number of people have referred to 50-year or 100-year floods. I would just like to point out, for the record, Citigroup has failed three times in the last 30 years. 1982, end of the 1980s on commercial real estate, and most recently, 2008, based on residential real estate. Th this is not a rare occurrence. This is the structure of the system that we have reinforced with the bailout mechanisms and now carry forward. And, and this brings us, of course, to Basel III and to capital. And, and there was much, again, for me to commend in, in Claudia's presentation. I do think the idea of countercyclical buffers is the right way to go. But the numbers are not the right, in the right ballpark, Claudio. It's not your fault. It's the Basel III process. It's what national governments want. It's what the bankers have asked their governments to deliver in that process. It is all about capture, cognitive capture at the national level. And I think it's time we talk about that more openly and more clearly, and, and, and very much in the direction that Andrew got. Of course, Andrew won an Oscar for his, for his presentation of these same issues in Inside Job, a movie that I, I, I insist you, you, all, you all go and see. But Claudio, seriously, let's talk numbers. Real estate trusts that can fail have 30% common equity relative to assets unweighted. 30%, three zero. Tell me, you can tell me, anyone can tell me, Tell me why that's not the right number. Why? And, and, and if you don't believe me on, on the analytics, or if you missed at all the points that Anat made, you must look at her web page on the Stanford Graduate School of Business website. It is absolutely compelling, must read on, the, on these issues. You can look at the, the people she's brought with her on this issue, the top names in finance, who are all laying down a challenge for officials and for the private sector. And, and we're saying, show us why moving towards Perhaps it's 30% at the peak, and then on a counter-cyclical buffer basis, it goes down to 20% when we have the crisis. Financial institutions in the United States lost average number, or the total number, 7% of total risk-weighted assets on this cycle. Well, why will the next cycle be, be any less uh, dramatic? And, and I can tell you, I, mean, I think you know, but let me tell you or reinforce you why this isn't happening. The bankers want to be paid, want to continue to be paid on an unadjusted for risk return on equity basis. Of course they do. And, and, and the way they get nice compensation packages is by taking a great deal of leverage. This is something behind all your presentations. How much money do they make? They make a lot of money doing this. But how much do they make? What's the size of the private gain relative to the public loss? My final point. The executives of the top 14 financial institutions in the United States took out in cash, salary, bonus, and stock options, $2.6 billion between 2000 and 2008. The top five took out about $2 billion. Those were roughly descending order Sandy Wilde, who built Citigroup, which then blew up after his watch. Henry, Walsh, Henry Paulson, who built Goldman Sachs and was the point man lobbying the government to lower leverage caps for investment banks, which even Larry Summers now says was a great mistake. Goldman Sachs blew up after his watch. Angelo Mazzillo, number three, built Countrywide, and that actually blew up on his watch. Dick Fould, number four, Lehman Brothers, Jimmy Kane, Bear Stearns, number five. So those five people took out $2 billion. That's a lot of money. What's, that's the private gain, one measure of it. What's the public loss? Uh, Mr. Summers actually said from this podium yesterday that the top money will be repaid from banks, and that's probably true. But that's not the cost. What's the cost? Is it 8 million jobs lost? Is it a 6% fall in employment with still 5% down below the peak? Is it... The increase in net federal government debt held by the private sector in the United States. Compare the Con Congressional Budget Office medium-term forecast for debt to GDP on that measure before the crisis and after the crisis. It's a 40%, 4-0% of GDP increase. That is a serious b banking crisis. That actually fits completely the pattern in, in Carmen Reinhardt's uh, work with, with Ken Rogoff on, on these issues. That's the cost we're looking at. That's what the banks did to us 
And they were saved completely for the reasons that have been laid before you by these presentations. And we have done nothing substantial, nothing significant, nothing that will prevent this from happening again and happening again soon. Thank you very much.